Welcome to my new series on the five most stunning or slightly different forks that you will see in a game of chess. Remember to subscribe and like this video and we'll move straight into these amazing examples. Well, this first example has a slightly feel-good feeling to it. We have the current world champion at the time, Antoli Karpov with the black pieces, and it's only on move 11, and in this position, he plays bishop to d6. An unbelievably bad move. And after white's next move, Karpov resigns immediately. Maybe this is an example of falling into a fork at the highest ever level, Karpov losing this game in a rather embarrassing fashion. Can you find the move that his opponent, Larry Christiansen, now played? He now played queen d1. And this is a classic fork. The queen is attacking the bishop and the knight, so it's creating a threat against two different pieces simultaneously. And there's nothing that Karpov can do, so he resigns on move 12. Oh dear, oh dear, Karpov. Time to hit the bar, maybe. We're actually using lots of world champions today in these examples of forks. And Magnus, with the black pieces here, is playing against uh, 960 world champion Wesley So. And he now pulls off a very nice, pretty combination to gain a major win of material. So imagine you're black here. Maybe the fork is not in this original position, but we will lead up to it. And it's the fork that wins the game. Slightly harder than the last one. Magnus to play. And how does he basically force resignation? Well, he starts off with queen takes d1 check, giving the queen up for the rook. Wesley actually resigned in this position, seeing the future. I suppose if you see your imminent death, you might as well just end it now. And the idea of this is after bishop takes d1, try to work out the idea if you can. Remember, you do have the pause button available. Rook to e1 is a forcing move. White's king has to move forwards. And now we come with another check on f1. The king can't go backwards now, because if it does, bishop to h3 is actually checkmate. So the king has to come to f3, and now the killer fork, knight to e5. And again, a move that creates a direct threat against two different pieces, the two most powerful pieces in this position. Crystal, crystal clear there from Magnus proving he is a brilliant tactician. We now come to a 1966 World Championship match, and this was between Petrosian of the White Pieces, of a uh, very strong player, known for his positional play more than anything, but as we see here, he's pretty good at some tactics, and Spassky, Boris Spassky, with the Black Pieces. And this was a, a really big moment in the match. And in this position, it's Petrosian to play with the white pieces. Can you find his move? Maybe Spassky was guaranteeing or hoping, should I say, that white would take on F7 when he has some survival chances. But there's a much stronger move. And this is a motif well worth remembering. I've used it in some of my games before. And the whole thing about these tactics, these forks, if you remember the sequence and you picture how the piece is moving, you might be able to prove your own game by putting it into motion there. The move is queen to h8 check. It's like four throwing a thunderbolt on the board. Spassky, whoa! Must have been really shocked had he not seen this coming. And the point of this queen, well, I say sacrifice, not really a sacrifice, is that after the knight... After this move, the knight becomes a merchant of havoc and it can jump into f6, creating this mammoth fork and next move, winning the queen, piece up and the game is over. Lovely, crisp tactics from Petrosian. Well, a fork, as I said, was defined really when a piece attacks two different targets, but you can sometimes self-fork and this is a very high level thing to do if you're trying to attack and it often comes in this kind of pawn structure we see in front of us here. This is taken from the match between Bobby Fischer with the white pieces and Macau Tao, two amazingly strong players and the candidates run up 
1959. And here, Bobby goes bishop to d5. He's forking and forking himself. Pronounce that very carefully if you try to say it. You could get in trouble. The forking he's doing is the rook and the knight, but he's also going into a fork, his knight and bishop. There's forking all over the shop here. Too many forks for my brain to calculate. And this is an amazing idea and a beautiful idea. And the point being, if Tao now takes the bishop, then we have queen takes d5 and the threat against the rook and the knight gives white a winning game. And had after this move black taken the knight, we just take the rook in the corner winning material. So Tao has to play rook a7 and after bishop takes e4, Bobby Fischer gained a nice advantage, even though he went on to lose this match, which is featured in one of my favorite books of all time, Macau Tao's Life and Times. Well worth uh, buying that book if you get a chance. Uh, both brilliant players from another era. But this whole idea of self-forking, very interesting, very beautiful, and it's something that we rarely get a chance to play on the board. Now to finish off my pick of five amazing forks, uh, I found a very bizarre example here. And this one I found while searching the internet and it's black to play and to win, believe it or not. A game taken from 1921, not with any really recognizable names. The player of the black pieces is called Mannheimer. And it's really bizarre, but can you see the mood that forced resignation? And this is a very unique fork here. Everything of white seems to be well defended, but one move of blacks, a real, again, bolt from the blue, is a winning idea. What is the move here? Well, the move is the unbelievable rook to e4. And this is a discombobulating move discombobulating white's rooks here, which were defending each other, but can no longer muster a defense. For example, if bishop takes rook, black can simply take that bishop with either pawn, and we can see that the black king has created a fork. Really amazing stuff, and black goes a piece up. And there's nothing really much that white can do here. If white tries rook takes, then black will again take with a pawn and there's another fork because we're attacking two different pieces, this time the bishop and the rook. So that's one of the more bizarre examples of rook to e4 uh, I can find over the internet. Well, you often find bizarre things when you search over the internet, that is true. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to like and subscribe, which helps me, helps the chess community. And I'm rhyming badly. That was terrible. And some, I think, stunning examples of forks there and historically important forks from chess history. Which was your favorite? Can you think of any that I may have missed out that you think deserve to be in my selection? Goodbye for now. I'll be back again in the near future.